yeah, and today I want to talk about the microbial interactions and their central metabolism uh, in a model multispecies uh, exelectrogenic biofilm community. Uh, first of all, I want to start with the, what is it, exelectrogenic microorganisms? Um, so uh, this is actually quite interesting and cool bacteria uh, that uh, can generate electrical uh, current uh, uh, by the oxidation of organic matter and transferring the electrons uh, to an electron acceptor extracellulary. So um, basically on this uh, nice photo made by my colleague uh, Yuri Gorby, you can see the huge cluster of the bacteria that uh, in the biofilm and they connect it with the nanovirus to each other, um, uh, creating uh, the extracellular electron transfer uh, via these nanovirus. And um, why extra extracellular respiration is important because it's uh, highly relevant for a huge number of biochemical cycles. Uh, for example, for reducing metal oxides um, uh, in the environment. Um, so where we can find this uh, exelectrogenic bacteria? Um, actually, in many in, um, different environments, for example, anaerobic sludge from uh, industrial or the domestic wastewater treatment or another anaerobic sediments like lakes. And um, these bacteria are found very um, um, relevant uh, usage in the uh, modern um, uh, anaerobic technology for uh, electricity production or energy production called microbial fuel cells. Uh, so what is microbial fuel cells is? Um, microbial fuel cells is a bioelectrochemical system uh, in which microbes basically convert chemical energy produced by uh, oxidation of organic or inorganic compounds in the electrical energy by sequential reactions in which electrons are transferred to terminal uh, electron acceptor, uh, extracellular, um, to generate electrical current. Um, so a typical microbial fuel cells reactor consists of two chambers, basically anode and uh, cathode. And uh, in anode chamber, all organic matters um, uh, or volatile fatty acids and so on, uh, they converted by, electro, uh, um, um, by bacteria to CO2 and uh, bacteria release electron to the uh, electrode surface. And then these electrons we are uh, closed circuit transferred to second chamber to the cathode where they confirm together, uh, convert together uh, with the oxygen to, CO, uh, to water. And uh, these two chambers are also separated by proton exchange membrane. So all protons from the anode chamber transfer to cathode chamber. And um, uh, in cathode chamber already opposite bacteria that can consume electrons from electrode, uh, go into the play and um, use these electrons to convert other chemicals in other chamber. So basically what happened in that node chamber is, uh, for example, if you will put wastewater with huge uh, organic load, this exelectrogenic bacteria, they will convert all organics, they degrade all organics from there and proceed there, for example, wastewater treatment and simultaneously produce the electricity. And um, in um, NMFC, anode chamber usually keeps uh, an oxic environment and cathode chamber uh, purged with the oxygen because uh, oxygen, oxygen together with the protons came from anode chamber, create the water. Um, yeah, and so the next question will be interesting, uh, like uh, how this extracellular um, tran electron transfer happening, how bacteria are capable to do this. And um, there are three main uh, types how bacteria can do it. Uh, first, they have direct transfer of electrons uh, to uh, electrode, uh, like electron acceptor. In our case, it's anode. We are cytochromes. 
And on the picture A, you can see the uh, bacteria is closely attached to electrode with the um, small uh, red cytochromes uh, as a transport of electrons. Um, second variation is the, to use uh, so-called microbial nanovirus or conductive pillar to, tran uh, to um, transfer the electrons. In this case, bacteria can cluster and as you remember the first uh, photo of bacteria, they were nicely, I can maybe jump quickly, the, the bacteria nicely connected together with the nanovirus and creating a huge biofilm and also uh, transfer electrons via this nanovirus to each other and to electrode. And in this case, only closely uh, attached bacteria to uh, electrode has um, cytochrome or direct contact. And uh, the third type of transfer uh, is uh, using uh, mediator or chemical compounds known as electron shuttle. In this case, bacteria doesn't need uh, direct contact with electrode, but uh, they use some chemicals available in the, in the medium or in the wastewater, and uh, they give electrons to these compounds, and compounds already transfer the electrons to electrode surface. And <laughs> going deeper into details, here you can see uh, the schematic view how uh, electrode and bacteria, um, how bacteria transfer electrons uh, extracellularly. So on the, on the left, you can see there is happening uh, organic conversion uh, via glucose, um, ATC cycle, and then the energy released. And then uh, electrons through the dehydrogenase and uh, several uh, steps of cytochromes moved through the uh, cell um, membrane out um, to electrode surface. And yeah, so for my study, uh, the Berto bacteria Chevanella onidensis. Geobacter sulfuroreducens and Geobacter metalloreducens was chosen because uh, this is already well studied ex electrogenic bacteria. And uh, what is also interesting, they have different characteristics and um, uh, enable for culturing. For example, Chevanella anadensis is a facultative anaerobic organism uh, for which lactate uh, seems to be the pretended. The, uh, preferred electron donor under anoxic conditions. And uh, these bacteria are capable to grow in, plank in planktonic phase. So meaning that uh, um, um, they can use uh, chemical mediators or shuttles to transfer the electrons to the electrode surface. On the other hand, to geobacter species, uh, they need direct contact with the electrode. So they're using cytochrome and pili to transfer the electrons to electrode. And both geobacters um, um, are anoxic bacteria. Uh, also, um, interesting to mention that geobacter sulfuroducens can tolerate some uh, oxygen amount. Um, yeah, and preferred carbon source for them is uh, acetate or propionate. And metalloreducens actually can uh, consume various, um, um, various sources of carbon. So, um, yeah, uh, our main question was uh, here, whether these three exoclogenic bacteria show like uh, distinct responses to be co together, can they create uh, like robust biofilm and also interest in how the cells will be distributed within this biofilm and planktonic phase in the reactor? and also to find their physiological role and maybe potential interactions within this biofilm. So uh, the experiment was carried for seven days and um, we grow them all these three strains separately, solitary in the reactor and also in one mixed conditions. So here in the graph A you can see the uh, growth curve where blue is uh, Geobacter sulfuroreducens, red is Chevanella anadensis, and green is uh, Geobacter metalloreducens. And you can see that during the whole the uh, whole course of uh, time course of the experiment, they were growing uh, 
actively and uh, geobacter sulfur reduces with the dominant strain on the anotrophase, whereas on figure B in planktonic phase, you can see that uh, Shevanella anadensis take the lead. And here you can see more in details how the uh, biofilm was developed. On the left circle, you can see the starting community um, um, distribution. And then uh, on the another phase, uh, the yellow color uh, sulfur reducence was the constant lead during the whole day, seven days experiment. And in planktonic, we can see the growth of Shivanella. Um, that actually was confirmed and corroborated with our fluorescence in situ hybridization analysis. That on picture A, we can see um, carbon uh, fibers of our electrode and they nicely cover it with uh, Gebacter with some um, sprinkle of uh, Chevanella and Dense cells. Uh, whereas on B, on picture B, we can see planktonic cells and they mainly pre uh, presented by Chevanella. Uh, uh, yeah. And uh, also interesting to uh, find out what happened with the substrate. Uh, for our initial substrate, we use lactate and propionate at the organic source. And um, lactate, as I already mentioned, uh, was used by Shivanella and Dances as preferable source and propionate uh, as the source of uh, organic from metalli reducens. And uh, in the mixed culture, we didn't uh, add any acetate because during the growth, actually, Shivanella and Dances, by using lactate, produce acetate. So we decided we don't need to add any extra acetate and bacteria together in culture can survive. Um, but uh, for the solitary experiment growth, we add some acetate for Gebacter sulfur reducens because acetate is the main carbon uh, source for them. And um, interestingly, what we found here, interestingly, is the um, uh, Gebacter sulfur reducens uh, consume acetate uh, during the solitary phase, uh, around the half of the presented uh, five millimolar, so like two and a half millimolar it was used, but during the co-culture, they use much way less acetate. And uh, another finding was about propionate. Um, so in the mixture, uh, it was five millimolar. And um, in both solitary growth cases of Gebacter and Shivanella, Gebacter sulfur reducens and Shivanella, we notice uh, increase of propionate concentration, meaning that most probably these bacteria produce propionate during the growth. Um, and uh, for metallic reducens, uh, we notice decrease of propionate, which is clear because it's, it was used. But in co-culture, we notice a decrease of propionate was much way less. So it means that something interrupted the propionate consumption in the co-culture conditions. So um, in order to gain insight into uh, metabolic changes uh, in the individual strains during the solitary growth versus uh, co-culture, uh, so we investigated transcriptomes and metatranscriptomes data. So here, uh, let's go deeper into details. What happened with the central metabolism in Gebacter sulfur reducens um, during the co-culture and versus solitary growth? And here, um, um, in the red marked genes that were highly uh, significantly upregulated in co culture conditions, and in green uh, genes that were downregulated. Um, so um, it was observed that Gebacter sulfur reducens during the co culture seems to be positively affected um, uh, for the substrate oxidations that we can see in the TCR cycle, uh, most probably. Uh, majority of the genes were um, upregulated during the co-culture conditions. Also interesting to know that outmembrane cytochromes uh, like OMB or OMC and also the periplums uh, cytochromes PPC a uh, majority of them and uh, together with the PLI uh, genes, PLA, 
they were all uh, significantly uh, upregulated under co-culture conditions. This indicates uh, that uh, generally more active transfer of electrons were happening uh, when the bacteria were growing together. Um, yeah, and um, another interesting thing was that the uh, heap cluster, it's hydrogenase cluster was highly upregulated during the co-culture. And although the um, uh, HGT regulator, hydrogen regulator was down-regulated, but typical uptake uh, hydrogenase whole cluster was upregulated. It might be due to the Jabacta sulfuroducens under co-culture conditions may enter the state uh, in which these bacteria start using hydrogen. And um, uh, yeah, this this actually might uh, open us um, the uh, understanding why the acetate was not uh, much used in co-culture conditions. Because when we uh, investigate the chemical uh, the acids uh, consumption in solitary growth, acetate was used much faster and uh, more. Um, it just because uh, probably Jabacter use both acetate and hydrogen in co-culture conditions. Um, yeah, and um, let's go to the uh, next train. What ha was happening with Shivanella and densis in co-culture conditions? Um, so in Schwannel and density cells also show distinct uh, responses to growth in the mixed culture biofilm. And we observe also um, upregulated um, MTRABC. Uh, this is a cluster of cytochromes also responsible for extracellular electron transfer. They were all upregulated in, co in the mixed co-culture conditions. Um, uh, yeah, and also um, uh, uh, protein coding genes involved in the uh, lactate transport and oxidation was also uh, uh, upregulated. This one is uh, LLD. So that meaning that co-cultivation seems positively affect the substrate oxidation as well. Um, uh, hydro hydrogenase, all uh, genes uh, for hydrogenase uh, also were highly uh, upregulated. Um, that uh, gives us also an idea that probably hydrogen formation in Schwannella and Densis might occur under anoxian conditions in the uh, absence of um, electron acceptor. And hydrogen may be derived directly from, for example, pyruvate because these genes were highly uh, up, um, regulated or indirectly from formate as an intermediate. Uh, for the last uh, member of this model biofilm, uh, we didn't um, notice a big difference. Or, so it seemed that the Jepacta metallic division showed um, um, less adaptation to growth together with the uh, other two strain. Uh, but here we notice interesting that PRP uh, genes, uh, PRP aperon, uh, was upregulated, and these genes encode uh, the necessary proteins for propionate oxidation. So it means that um, most probably Jabacta metalloreducens consume much more prop propionate. Um, which might be questionable because uh, based on our chemical analysis, propionate was consumed much less. Uh, then we'll be the question, what happening? And if you look at the solitary growth of Shivanella and Jabacter, these two strains actually produce propionate. So it might be the case that uh, an average amount, propionate amount was highly presented in the co-culture conditions. That's why a metallic strain were forced to consume more propionate. That's why these genes uh, were highly upregulated in co-culture conditions. Um, yeah. So um, based on 
all this um, analysis uh, made by chemical analysis and transcriptomic analysis, uh, we propose the microbe microbe and microbe electrode interactions within this model uh, exeltrogenic biofilm. And uh, our idea is that Schwannella anodensis, uh, marked in red, uh, uses lactate as an electron donor and produces acetate along with hydrogen and carbon dioxide. Then acetate and hydrogen are consumed by Gebacter sulfur reducing cells marked in yellow. And, uh, and then the Gebacter sulfur reducing system as electron donors. Uh, the Gebacter metallic reducing cells marked in green uh, is proposed to consume propionate as a primary electron donor. So while Chebacter sulfur reducens and metallic reducens transfer electrons via direct contact, uh, you can see them attached to the electrode. Um, uh, we are using nanowires. Shivanella anodensis can use uh, flavin molecules or so-called electron shuttles. Um, so it is possible that Chebacter strains um, uh, use flavins uh, released by Chevanella anodensis because interestingly, only uh, in co culture conditions, Chebacter sulfur reducing cells were noticed or were uh, identified in planktonic phase, but not during the solitary growth. So it means that probably these cells can take the electron shuttles produced by Chevanella in planktonic and then they don't require the uh, direct contact with the electrode. There's also like interesting interactions between the bacteria. Um, yeah, uh, moreover, interestingly, the Chivanella anodensis together with the Gebacter sulfur reducens uh, might protect Gebacter metallic reducens from the oxidative stress by reducing oxygen to water uh, because metallic reducens is a strict anaerobic bacteria. And nevertheless, some oxygen was still detected in the reactor. Uh, metallic reducens uh, cells survived. Uh, yeah, um, metabolic uh, exchange reactions between the organism are represented by continuous arrows. So, electron transfer actions are represented. Uh, yeah, and electron uh, transfer actions are represented here by dots. So, uh, I just want to sum up. Um, all the information <laughs> and uh, say that obtained results actually highlights the different ecological niches of these three uh, model organisms that actually in enable to not only grow in parallel together but also have a positive uh, interaction within their biofilm. And also, um, inter interestingly, that the biofilm on the anode surface was clearly dominated by Gervacta sulfur reducens. In planktonic phase, uh, Shivanella and Denson cells were uh, the major contributor. And our uh, transcriptomic results pointed towards uh, positive interactions between all cells together. And um, Shivanella and Densis and Jabacta sulfur reducens uh, significantly upregulated their central metabolism and uh, together with the extracellular electron transfer via uh, automembrane as a response to cultivation together. Um, and Shivanella anodensis also was likely displayed as a uh, bacteria that produce hydrogen uh, and in combination with the Gebacter sulfur reducens that can this hydrogen consume. So they have win-win situation <laughs> in the biofilm. And also worth to notice that uh, for Gebacter sulfur reducens, uh, co-cultivation with Chevanella was also beneficial because uh, they can steal uh, electron shuttles from Chevanella and Edensis and they don't require then the direct contact with the electrode and they can uh, spread also in planktonic phase of the reactor. Uh, yeah, to get a... I want to acknowledge my uh, unit who helped me to do this uh, work and uh, my supervisor and uh, Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology we are working right now and LCU for your attention. And yeah, if you have questions, any kind of questions, yeah, please let me know. <laughs>
Okay, thank you so much. We have a lot of time for questions. So um, if you're interested, you can give a question mark at the in the chat section and uh, unmute yourself, or you can directly just type the question and I can say it for you. Mm -hmm. Ah uh, yes, uh, Darko, would you like to unmute? He has a yes. Question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Hi Anna, good to Hi. hear more about your research. Really, really <laughs> interesting. I didn't know all these details. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and, and thank you for giving the talk at four a.m. It's <laughs> quite <laughs> impressive. So my question is: when you have this um, community with three electrogenic bacteria. Did you measure how much more electricity it produces with respect to one with a single species or pairs of species? Mm -hmm. Or they were not displaying the way that there was a current going? Because I remember in the introduction, you showed that you needed two different cells, like cathode and anode. And okay. for me, it wasn't clear is if the reactor was working in that way or was just a culture. Uh, yeah, thank you for your question. Yeah, probably I didn't uh, show this because I wanted to show so many information, but my time is limited. Uh, yes, of course, I measure the uh, electricity production in solitary growth versus uh, mixed culture growth. And uh, all together, uh, when they grow in all together, they produce slightly more uh, current. And uh, in solitary growth, um, uh, I would say the double amount of electricity was produced. Although uh, Gerbacter sulfuroducens were the leader on the electrode, right? Uh, it was the major contributor. And when it was growing solitary, it produced maybe two thirds of the electrical current in a mixture, but still all in combination, they, they get more energy. Yeah. Thanks. Any more questions? <laughs> I have a question. It's it's such a fascinating system. Um, how long do you usually run an experiment? How long can you get continuous electro electricity production out of these bacteria? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for the question. So this uh, particular experiment was for seven days, but this was a batch experiment. So once the bacteria consume all the presented organics, um, they, they stop sort of. But uh, we also sometimes run in our lab long-term experiments, but then we usually uh, pumped with a, um, a new medium or sometimes we do it in naturally existing environment, like we pump in waste streams continuously and then the system can work actually for a long time and uh, now we have in the lab experiment that was running over a year yeah can i ask another question sure sure so uh are there any today practical applications of this system or is it still in development? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you for this question. Um, actually, originally, that's interesting. Uh, Exelectrogenic bacteria uh, first were found maybe 100 years ago, but uh, at the beginning of 20th century, right? But then people like didn't know how to use this and what to do with it. And uh, the main interest uh, started to be developed maybe at the 90s or beginning of 2000s. And then these bacteria start studying very actively and um, uh, everything started with the lab scale experiment. But now people start to use already uh, some pilot scale reactor. And actually in OIST, uh, I was working um, with a um, I started working with the cathode reactions and, and investigated cathode reactor uh, community. And um, we built a pilot scale and we already tested in the local farms. <laughs> and after one year of running, they show very promising results. So I would say that this is quite uh, 
I think, um, good competing uh, technology for future. Thank you for your question. <laughs> Um, if I may ask a question, that's yeah. a super interesting talk. Um, following up on uh, what you just said, so are these organisms like self-sustaining if they can last for over a year, as you just said? Mm -hmm. If you do, you have to like keep adding more nutrients, or are they like you uh, mentioned, create nutrients by themselves and then just interact and share the nutrients? How does it work? uh yes you should add some more nutrients yeah thank you for your question but uh they can um uh, as a for example on, on an example of shavanella anadensis agiobacter sulfuric uh they self um feeding bacteria basically but if for example one strain lack of uh the substrate then uh, this bacteria can't produce anything and then another bacteria else will be suffering. So we would need constantly to add uh, the basic uh, substrate that requires for, for all bacteria. Yeah. Uh, for example, that uh, like long experiment in if we are not using the synthetic medium and we use uh, the natural source, for example, waste streams, uh, waste water, uh, then we just basically always add some new fresh wastewater that was not treated yet. Yeah, and our goal in this case was to eliminate all the organics from the wastewater, right? So we can uh, pump it um, with a certain hydraulic retention time uh, that will be sufficient enough to treat it and then uh, pump, uh, to replace it with a fresh one. And the, the biofilms are strong enough once they're established to prevent establishment of other bacteria that are in the wastewater or are these removed before you pump it in? Mm. Yeah, thank you for the question. Actually, it was interesting to us as well to investigate. And uh, it's not presented here, but uh, it was published in our other paper that uh, we tested how stable can be this model biofilm if we uh, Re release it to the natural environment, right? So we preset the biofilm uh, with these three model um, strains. And um, after one week of uh, in inoculation on the on creating a, um, biofilm on the surface, we start pumping the real wastewater with the real bacteria. And surprisingly, uh, this uh, model biofilm shows very good results of stability, although uh, not all bacteria survive on the surface and they were replaced with the natural community. Uh, but still, um, I would say that um, maybe 40% were still remaining on the electrode. That is a very good result. But also was interesting because uh, some geobacterial um, reproducents, for example, they uh, naturally occur in the waste. So uh, in our case, we just uh, measure only our um, bacteria uh, that we provided with a special barcode and we could uh, monitor them via quantitative uh, PCR and uh, yeah. We all have a question from Isabella. Uh, mm -hmm. She wants to ask if you were able to map the genes that were being up or down regulated in co-culture mm -hmm. um, to the microbes, to the individual microbes, if these genes are shared across multiple species. So mm -hmm. were, you, were you able to assign them to individual microbes when you are doing uh, multi-species transcriptomics? Mm -hmm. Interesting question. So basically, in our analysis, we just mapped them uh, mixed culture versus solitary bacteria. And we did three independent comparison, like mixed culture versus Gebacter uh, sulfuroducens or mixed culture versus Shivanella onidensis and Metalloreducens. Yeah, but that would be maybe also interesting, like a next step. Mm -hmm. 
All right, shall we uh, thank our speaker with uh, online, I don't know. Thank you. And then we can start with the second talk. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you. And our next speaker is Gary. She's a fourth year PhD student at Stanford. Uh, she works on how genetic variations influences phenotypes in individuals and community. Uh, she's passionate about environmental, ethical, political, and cultural significance of uh, bioengineered wild organisms, social justice, and STEM equality. We should have some conversation together later. <laughs> uh, today, she'll be talking about uh, rapid evolution, uh, how it alters community dynamics, especially in nectar yeast community, and how the resist priority effect. Over to you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Yes, I'm happy to answer questions about this research or talk about STEM equality, uh, social justice, <laughs> or uh, education all day. So two of my big passions. Also art, all of the um, artwork in this talk is original artwork by me. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for the awesome opportunity to chat today with you about some ongoing uh, dissertation research. I'm going to be telling you a story about rapid evolution, about meta-community assembly in nectar inhabiting microbes. Um, I'm like you said, I'm a fourth year PhD student with Ted Bukami at Stanford. Um, and I'm very, very excited about the topic, um, which I think is a perfect framing for this project. So today's session addresses the question, what structures microbial community assembly? And oftentimes we think about niche and neutral processes as kind of dichotomous or complementary processes, but really distinct. So with some examples here of wood decomposers, human gut microbiome, and reef ecosystems, um, we'll think about niche process, process, processes as predictable, as mechanistic, for example, you know, nitrogen utilization and wood decomposers, uh, you know, human diet and human gut microbiome, or maybe water temperature for reefs. Um, and sometimes we think about neutral processes as stochastic, right? Like what are the processes that influence different communities and different logs, for example, or different communities and different human guts, or, uh, you know, algae versus coral dominated reefs. Um, but today in this talk, I want to actually talk about how these processes are really tightly connected, how they interplay with one another, and how a useful framework for looking at the relationship between niche and neutral processes is historical contingency, looking at the history of community assembly, looking at the arrival of organisms, and how those influence, how those communities assemble and change over time. So the study system um, I'll be talking to you about today are these nectar inhabiting microbes that our lab has worked on for a long time and many others. And I'm going to be telling you about some complementary field experiments and lab experiments that give some insight into how historical contingency is a framing, uh, is a good framework for understanding microbial community assembly or community assembly even outside of microbial systems. So we focus on the sticky monkey flower or bush monkey flower, Diplocus or Mimulus or Antiochus, which is a broadly distributed woody plant throughout Northern California. And we're gonna focus on two different types of nectar microbes in the nectar of these flowers, a nectar bacteria, Acinetobacter nectaris, and a nectar yeast, Meshnicovia rickaufii, that are very cosmopolitan, not just in this plant species. And today's talk is going to focus on three questions. The first one is what processes, niche or neutral or niche and neutral, govern the assembly of nectar microbe communities? What is the mechanism of community assembly in the system? And then how can we use these, our understandings of these mechanisms to predict species interaction and community assembly? So for the first question, what are the processes that govern the assembly of nectar microbe communities? I'm gonna tell you first about a field survey that was led by Manfred Dami and a team of graduate students, undergrads, and even Tad. But before I dive into the field survey, I wanna acknowledge that this field work was conducted on lands that were originally and still inhabited by the Esalen, Ohlone, and Coast Miwok tribes. I wanna acknowledge that our, our lab, the Fukami Lab, Stanford University, and every institution in the United States has benefited from historically and to this day from indigenous peoples. And I also want to acknowledge this contribution through this fieldwork 
many of the ideas that went into this talk and this research in ecology and evolution as a field is deeply rooted in indigenous knowledge. And I don't have as much time to speak about this as I would like to during this talk, but I encourage you to ask questions later, have conversations in your communities, and you can learn more by going to the QR code that's on this slide. So turning back to the research conducted on this indigenous land, we visited sticky monkey flowers. The team who did this field work visited sticky monkey flowers all over these sites from uh, Bodega Bay all the way down to Big Sur. And they looked at the microbial communities in each flower. They were able to measure the bacteria and yeast density. So here's an example of a flower that was mostly dominated by bacteria. Some flowers were dominated by yeast and some flowers were co-dominated by both bacteria and yeast. So let's take a look at the data. So here is uh, looking at the distribution of flowers where each point represents a flower microbial community and the relative densities of bacteria and yeast. So all of these yellow points down here, these are all flowers that had variable levels of yeast, but very little or no bacteria. And these are all flowers that had variable levels of bacteria, but no yeast. You might notice there are very few flowers that have both bacteria and yeast. And even when we zoom into the corner of this plot where the majority of the data is, you can still see that the vast majority of flowers had either bacteria or yeast and very few of these purple dots had both were co-dominated. So this is kind of a surprising finding that you get these like alternative states, bacteria or yeast. And that made us wonder what drives these assemblages? Are they niche or are they neutral processes? Well, we had a hypothesis that actually historical contingency specifically a mechanism called priority effects or a process called priority effects that combines niche and neutral processes might be at play to explain the surprising distribution of community states in the field. So here's the hypothesis. We thought that there might be priority effects occurring between bacteria and yeast. And the way this works is a balance between neutral and niche. So the neutral process comes first. So imagine you've got a flower that has no microbes and microbes get inoculated into that flower, which you can think of as a discrete microbial community by a pollinator such as Anna's hummingbird, which is the main pollinator for these, for these plants. Yes, so amazing. Get to study hummingbirds, love it. So this flower gets used first, just stochastically, because the hummingbird happened to have that on its beak. And maybe this flower got bacteria first because that hummingbird maybe visited a flower that had bacteria and just brought bacteria stochastically to this flower. So the first part is stochastic. But after the initial inoculation, after the kind of early immigration to a new community, then niche processes take over. So perhaps this yeast, when it arrives first the flower, it uses up the nitrogen such that even when bacteria maybe are later arriving, are later arriving immigrants through pollination, they're not able to grow well in this flower and it stays dominated by yeast. Whereas in this flower, when there was bacteria first, maybe the bacteria changed the environment such that even if yeast came later, that uh, community was still dominated by bacteria. So priority effects really balance these neutral and niche processes uh, in an important way that we think structure this field observation. And we had some insights about this from prior work in the lab that looked at bacteria or yeast, yeast interactions and some work with different bacterial species. But we really wanted to nail down whether priority effects really were happening to explain this field result. And so two undergraduates a couple of summers ago did an independent summer project to look at priority effects between this bacteria and this yeast species. Instead of looking at flowers and pollinators in the field, they were able to do it in the lab by looking at uh, microbial growth in tubes as flowers and using pipettes instead of pollinators. And so this is a simplified version of their experiment, but essentially they ran an experiment where they had yeast arrive in a tube first and then bacteria later and then measured their growth after several days and the opposite of that when bacteria arrive first and then yeast and measured their growth. Now for this talk, even though we did many of these experiments with bacteria, we're going to focus on the yeast. And so a simplified result here shows that when bacteria arrive first, versus when yeast arrive first, the yeast don't grow as well, which suggests that there is a negative priority effect. And indeed, there are, I'm not showing you this here just to simplify things, but when we grow them by themselves with all the controls, this uh, priority effect is really strong. So this suggests that there are negative priority effects between bacteria and yeast. So to answer our question, what processes might govern the assembly of these nectar microbe communities, we think priority effects are really important. But what is the mechanism? 
Well, because we were able to do these experiments in the lab instead of in the field, we were able to more easily get at some of the mechanisms that might be influencing this important interaction. So for example, we think, we thought that maybe bacteria lower the nectar pH and that's what hurt the yeast. So if bacteria arrive first to a flower, maybe it lowers the pH such that it's hard for later arriving yeast to be able to grow. And when we did, when we looked at nectar pH in these microcosms, we saw that as bacterial density increased, the nectar pH dropped from pH around five, which is like a cup of coffee, down to pH of two, which is a lemon. So you can imagine that, that might be a real, or not a lemon, but lemon juice, it might be really hard for yeast to be able to grow in lemon juice when they first arrive. So this seemed like a compelling mechanism for which bacteria exert negative priority effects against yeast. But we also wanted to know, well, what about the yeast? You know, what influences the yeast's ability to be able to fight or be able to grow with bacteria or be able to not grow very well with bacteria? And so we wanted to look at existing genetic variation that occurred in yeast. So getting back to our field sites, uh, there was a 2018 paper that was published from Manfred and where she isolated a bunch of different strains of that yeast species, Meshnikobia recalfii, 102 from all of these different sites. And when she did whole genome sequencing, she found that they cluster into three different genotypes. Um, so we chose three strains from each of the genotypes that represented differences in regional genetic diversity. And we asked, do the strains differ in their resistance to priority effects? And what we found is that yes, they actually do. So uh, this zero, this is the initial, the effective initial bacterial dominance on yeast growth. So if it's zero, it means that the bacteria didn't uh, affect the yeast at all. And the more negative, the more they were hurt by bacteria. And you can see that this strain, MR1, was really negatively affected by bacteria compared to the other two. So there seems to be some influence of genetic variation in the response to bacterial priority effects. And the last thing we wanted to know was, well, what does this mean in a landscape context? What does this mean at all these different individual sites? And so we wanted to know at the different sites, were there different numbers of bacteria versus yeast dominated flowers? So we were able to count the number of flowers at each site. There were 96 flowers harvested at every site. Um, how many of them were dominated by bacteria, dominated by yeast, or co-dominated? And so you can see here, this is the number of sites. This is our all different sites. And these are the number of flowers of each type. And you can see that this site, site number one, which is Bodega Bay, had very relatively few flowers that were dominated by bacteria, few flowers are co-dominated, and also not that many flowers that were yeast dominated. But compared to Muir Woods, which is site number two, there were many, many more flowers that were dominated by bacteria. And so you can see that across the different sites, there's variance in how many flowers were dominated by bacteria particularly. And so given these things, you know, these three observations about the mechanisms of priority effects are important and um, influencing factors on priority effects that bacteria lower the pH, which inhibits yeast growth, that genetic variation influences yeast susceptibility to bacteria, and that there's this difference in site based on bacteria versus yeast dominance. We wanted to know whether these mechanisms could explain what or predict species interactions. So how can we use this information to actually not just say, okay, that's interesting, but like actually predict how species interactions occur and how they change over time and how this influences community assembly. And so the strategy we took was a little bit unexpected. We decided to take a, a play out of the evolutionary genetics playbook and use experimental evolution. So we wanted to know if we in the lab could experimentally evolve yeast to better resist bacteria based on our hypotheses about these niche-based mechanisms. And uh, this was very, I think, a very interesting way to address this, and we found some interesting conclusions I'm excited to tell you about. So we started out by isolating yeast from flower nectar, um, such as in those surveys, and that yeast I'm going to call ancestral. Now, this is not like from a long time ago. This is ancestral in the context of this experimental evolution lab experiment. And fun fact, the ancestral strain we used was the strain that was like pretty affected by bacteria to begin with, MR1, that I just showed you in that prior slide. So we took this yeast and we put it in tubes of nectar, simulating yeast arriving at a flower, just like at the experiments that I told you before, where each tube represents a flower. And in, you know, old school experimental evolution way, we transferred about a 10th of the total volume of the, uh, of the nectar with, with yeast growing in it every two days to some fresh nectar. 
And even though this is a really common uh, experimental strategy for, you know, Saccharomyces yeast geneticists, it actually is a really cool strategy for this system because it has ecological basis. This is just like yeast growing in a flower, getting moved to a new flower every two days by a pollinator, which is something that actually happens. And so what we did was we transferred 30 different times over the course of two months, which is similar to the length of a flowering season, these yeast in this nectar environment to ask how will they evolve to the nectar, to the uh, treatment. And so what we started out was this ancestral, but we got evolved yeast that were evolved to the particular treatment that we were transferring in. And this is similar to yeast moving around over the course of entire flowering season between different flowers uh, and, and evolving, right? But we didn't just do this with this normal synthetic nectar. We did it with two different types of nectars that simulated early arrival by bacteria that were based on our hypotheses about the mechanisms of priority effects. So we didn't just have yeast that were evolved in the normal, but we had yeast that were evolved in a nectar where we grew bacteria in it and then we filtered it out. So it looked like bacteria had arrived first, but really there was not. And a, and a nectar where we just lowered pH to the same level as this bacteria condition nectar. So this tested, the, this comparison, tested whether our hypothesis about the mechanism being low pH really was true. And so again, we wanted to see if we can involve yeast to resist bacteria by uh, serially transferring them in environments that looked like bacteria were present. So to address this question, can we evolve yeast to resist bacteria? The first question is, uh, did the yeast evolve in bacteria-like environments that are resist bacteria? And the second one is, did evolution happen? Is there a genetic change? So to get at this first question, whether these evolved yeast uh, were able to better resist bacteria, we did some prior effects experiments like I told you before. Um, also, I just want to quickly acknowledge that this uh, evolution experiment was done in collaboration with an undergraduate research course, uh, the Introduction to uh, Research in Ecology and Evolution, Bio 47. Um, and this was uh, investigated uh, two years ago, and a lot of the preliminary results for this experiment were actually um, collected by Stanford undergraduates who were just learning about ecology and evolution for the first time. So big shout out to the students and also the amazing teaching staff that made this happen. And it turns to these priority effects experiments that the undergrads, uh, undergraduate students started and were continued by another team of undergraduates, about 10 undergraduates that have worked with me full time or part time in the lab, Team Nectar Microbe, who did the remainder of the experiments I'm going to tell you about today. So they did these priority effects experiments, just like I told you about before, where we, um, where we modified the initial dominance of either bacteria or yeast to a tube and then had several controls to ask whether our early arrival or initial dominance by bacteria affected yeast and how that differed based on the evolutionary history of the yeast. So our hypothesis was that the yeast that were evolved in those bacteria-like environments, so the nectar that was um, conditioned by bacteria or was low pH, that these guys will better resist bacterial dominance. And so again, just like the plot I showed you before, I'm going to show you points that show the effect of initial bacterial dominance on yeast growth. So if the points are down here, it means that the yeast grew worse with bacteria. And if the points are up here, it means the yeast grew better with bacteria. And what we found was that the two yeast strains that were evolved in those bacteria-like con conditioned nectar, they really were less affected by bacteria. They were still hurt by bacteria, but much less so than the ancestral or even the yeast that were evolved in that neutral normal nectar where they you know, were not used to the environment created by bacteria. So what's really interesting and cool about this, in addition to this, this finding, is that yeast that never had even seen bacteria before were still able to resist bacterial priority effects simply through this niche-based, our predicted niche-based mechanism. And when we compare the low pH and the condition, there's no difference. So this strongly supports our hypothesis that the mechanism of priority effects on, on yeast by bacteria is through low pH. So our main conclusion here is that based on our niche-based prediction of low pH being the mechanism of bacterial priority effects, we were able to resist yeast to better, to better resist bacteria. So our hypotheses about what was going on based on field and some preliminary lab experiments held up when we tried to evolve them in the lab. So this begs the question, well, what is the genetic basis of this resistance? Are they just, you know, responding differently, but they didn't actually change their genome? To address this, we sequenced evolved genomes. And I'm going to tell you just the beginning of the story that we're still working on. So 
hot off the presses. So we sequenced all of these strains. Um, and one thing that I'll point out that's cool about this experiment is we didn't just evolve um, one, one lineage in a particular environment. We actually did it four separate times so we can look at the comparability of evolution within the same treatment. So we sequenced the evolved genomes. This was work that was done by some awesome collaborators um, in addition to me, where we extracted and sequenced DNA from all of the samples. We mapped reads to a reference and compared that to the ancestral. We called variants and we did some variant filtering. Just want to have a shout out that uh, we used a new variant calling Snake Make Pipeline, automated pipeline um, that was developed by Lucas Check called Green Pipe. So if you're doing any of this analysis, definitely touch base with me and I'll put you in contact with Lucas. He's awesome and this process in the pipeline was super great. Could not recommend enough. But at the end, we had all these variants that were you know, different locations across the genome that differed between the different treatments and the ancestral. And so I'm gonna show you a Manhattan plot that looks at all of these comparisons. So on the y-axis here are the scaffolds. So you can think pseudochromosomes. This is the location of a bunch of different sites across the genome. And the y-axis here is significant difference between treatments. Because what we wanted to know was not just did it differ from the ancestral, but how did the treatments differ from each other, right? How, what is the genetic basis of differences in adaptation to the different environments? The normal nectar, the low pH nectar, and this conditioned nectar. So when we compare the replicates between treatments, we can find locations of the genome that were the, the at that location, there were significant differences between the treatments and the, the mutation was de novo. So that mutation was not present in the ancestor. And so you can see that across the genome in all of these comparisons, there are a variety of sites that were de novo mutations that differed between treatments. So we're working now to figure out, you know, what are the regions that these uh, variants fall into and what are some of the functions, trying to get at stories that we've actually just heard about in the prior talk from Anna. So we're really interested in seeing um, kind of what are the implications, how can we tie this genomics data to our phenotypic data I just told you about, but we can say the treatments really did differ in de novo mutations. Uh, and this seems to be the basis of these phenotypic effects that I, I just shared with you. So to address our question, how can we use these mechanisms to predict species interactions and community assembly, we were truly put our money where our mouth was, we truly tested the effect of our hypothesized mechanism by evolving yeast to resist priority effects by bacteria based on those niche-based predictions related to genetic variations important, low pH seems to play a role, and we think the evolution is quite rapid. It can occur over a single flowering season because each of those sites that differ in the prevalence, the regional prevalence of bacteria or yeast exert different pressures to get resistance to bacteria, right? Because there's not as much of a selective pressure we would think in sites that don't have very many bacteria, right? Don't have many flowers that are dominated by bacteria as those sites that had more flowers that were dominated by bacteria. And we were able to take it all the way or most of the way by looking at the genomic basis of these adaptations by sequencing evolved genomes, which is work that's ongoing. So just to summarize the key question here that we wanted to address, how historical contingency can be a useful framework for uh, synthesizing niche and neutral processes. We started out with a field observation that there are these alternative states in the field. Some flowers are dominated by bacteria, some are dominated by yeast, which to a naive observer might seem like a neutral process. But when we tested in the lab this hypothesis that priority effects might be the, the mechanism, the process that structures this community assembly, we were able to combine both niche and neutral processes to try to predict why we might see these alternative states. And because we were able to use this mechanistic approach, we were able to find that through experimental evolution, we can predict apparent neutral processes. The mechanisms we thought were going on with the priority effects are in fact the case, and we can evolve yeast to do exactly what we thought they were doing in the field. So I think that this is a really exciting result that should, um, that might structure how you think about microbial community assembly, no matter what system you work on. So niche and neutral processes can be connected through the lens of historical contingency in all the systems that actually I brought up at the beginning. We found that in wood decomposer communities, historical contingency and priority effects are super important and the strength and the relative effects of top-down versus bottom-up factors in wood decomposer microbial community assembly. In the human gut microbiome, the 
initial gut microbiome from your mom, right, when a baby is born, has dramatic influences on the trajectories of those microbe communities moving forward. And then in reefs, there's also a really important fact of predation, other trophic interactions that influence multiple stable states, whether reefs become dominated by algae or whether they uh, stay corals. So this historical contingency, I think, is a really important factor that connects niche and neutral processes that hopefully will impact the way you think about community assembly in your system, whether that's microbial or not. So with that, I just want to make a couple of quick acknowledgments to the many, many, many people who were involved in this work. Of course, the amazing Fukami Lab, uh, a big team that was involved in the field work I shared with you, um, experimental evolution advice, uh, work on genomics, uh, the Bio47 team, shout out to Shamala, who I think is here today. Um, also, Sur is here today. He was involved in experimental evolution and genomics components of this project. And my beloved undergraduate team, Team Nectar Microbe, that made all of the magic happen. So thank you so much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs>